Well, good morning. I want to welcome everybody here this morning. It is great to see your smiling faces. I also want to welcome people who are here, uh, who are joining us via YouTube. Even though I can't see your face, I'm assuming that you're smiling this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Yesterday was a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day so far. Um, it's going to be a little rainy this afternoon probably, but it's still, uh, there's finally a warmth in the afternoons and it's just refreshing. I, I got up yesterday morning, it was the first day of spring gobbler and went out hunting and it, it's one of those, it's just an odd time to figure out what to wear because it was 27 degrees when I got out of my car yesterday morning and it was within three hours it was 57 degrees and so you know like I'm walking through the woods uh, with my son-in-law and I kept saying to him, we're going to have to stop. I got to take off some clothes. And, and I think he was nervous that at one point I was going to be walking around in just a pair of underwear. It just kept getting warmer and warmer. But I, I love springtime. I love the newness. I love the freshness. I love the smell. I, I love the, the imagery of new life. And so I also want to welcome you here this morning because we get to celebrate new life. We celebrate a resin savior jesus we celebrate his resurrection his conquering of death and the the hope that he has that he extends to us for new life so i'm sorry i could just get you know wound up thinking about that um we are going to have for those of you who are present here this morning we are going to have communion uh, a little later in the service at, at the end of the service um and so as as you listen to the message as you participate in singing just be thinking about that the fact that, that Christ has offered us life eternal. But it's not just that, that after um, when you get to heaven. It's here and now, a rich, full, vibrant life. He, he welcomes us into that. We celebrate that life. So we'll be doing that uh, through communion a little later. Uh, just one announcement that I have this morning, and then I'm going to ask Lynn uh, Stump to come up and read a uh, passage of scripture, share a passage of scripture with you this morning. Um, and that is that according to the plan, anyway, we're, we'll see what happens with the weather, but according to the plan, we're having our parking lot resurfaced this week. Uh, they're starting Tuesday, and they said it'll be three days. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, our church office will be closed. Um, I'll be working from somewhere other than here because our parking lot is closed. So don't show up at the church looking for me or access because you won't get either. So that's this week, uh, the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of uh, May. And then one other thing that I didn't have listed in my announcements, but I just wanted to say thank you to uh, all of you who, were, who continue to sponsor and, and um, provide for and give toward the ministry of of um, Morningstar Pregnancy Services, but this Thursday night was their banquet, and uh, Nicole C. Mullen spoke at it, and as, as a sponsor of that banquet, our church is a sponsor of that banquet, um, I received a copy of her book, My Redeemer Lives, um, and so because the church sponsored, I really feel like this is not my book, this is our book, um, which means we have to share it, but we can share it. I'm going to lay it on the table over there. If you'd like to read this book, please feel free to pick it up. When you're done reading it, please feel obligated to bring it back so somebody else can read it. So I'll put this over there then. <laughs> we should sign it out. We'll work on the honor system. Um, those are all the announcements I have, so I'm going to ask Lynn if she would come up and uh, read a passage of scripture this morning, and then we will open our service with a word of prayer. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture from the Word of God is found in James uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accom accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Will you join me in prayer? Father, as we come before you this morning we do want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing 
a way for us to be made right with you, to be put into a right relationship with you, but more than just a right relationship, actually adopted into your family so that we can call you Father. Lord, so often we allow things to get in the way of us living for you, and I pray that you would uh, gently, through your Spirit, convict us of those things so that we would see them and deal with them. Lord, our desire is to follow you wholeheartedly, passionately, unreservedly, continually, and instantly. Lord, you, as Jesus, as you taught us to pray, you said, pray these words, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we recognize that your will is done continually in heaven. So we ask that you would give us the strength and, and, the, and the courage, the commitment, and the endurance to follow you and do your will continually. We want to lift your name in praise this morning, Lord, and I ask that you would uh, just stir in our hearts uh, a deep joy and a sense of, of all that we have in you as we lift our voices and sing your praises. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with us. And let's glorify our great God. Before anything else, God was alone, and he stood alone. 
And now will we choose to stand with him, even if it requires us to stand alone as far as the world is concerned, knowing that we're really not standing alone because God is standing with us.
is our prayer that our deeds would outrun our words, that our life would truly reflect you, that how we live our lives, the things we do, would line up with what we say we believe, that there would be no difference, that our faith and our deeds would, would mesh together neatly, and that people would recognize and see our faith through our deeds, that we would live for you, taking a stand for you, unashamed of you, being willing to stand even against opposition, being willing to stand alone, knowing that we are truly standing with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Peak is a developmental assessment and coaching process that dares your church to expect more. Written into its name, prepare to expect the advance of the kingdom. Peak prepares your church to expect that the kingdom will advance through the ministry of your church into its community, region, and world. So what is Peak really? First, it's a culture. Throughout the Peak process, we initiate three culture shifts that are essential and biblical to the vitality of your church. Culture of improvement means it's normative and positive to ask the hard questions. What are we doing here? What's working? What's not? And how are we going to get where God is leading us? Culture of collaboration means that we are designed to work together. A siloed church or an isolated pastor are antithetical to who the church is called to be as a community of believers who work together as the body of Christ. Culture of excellence means that we steward the ministry of the church thoughtfully and intentionally to the best of our abilities. Second, it's a process. It starts with an in-depth survey distributed online to your congregation and to your leadership. Finally, a peak coach is with you along the way to help you discover more for your church, to help you envision where God is leading you, to help you act upon ways that can bring momentum to the ministry of your church, and to sustain the ministry that God has given you. Peak has been carefully crafted so that every church, no matter its geographical location, no matter its size, life cycle, or ethnic background, can participate in Peak to gain insights. So are you ready to expect more? Can you envision more baptisms, more healings, more kids in that nursery, more marriages restored, more addicts coming clean, and more divisions unified? Can you envision honest and honorable conversations? Those kinds that bring clarity to your purpose, that get at root issues, and that create a path forward. Can you envision momentum? The kind of momentum that brings excitement, energy, and even fun to your daily work. I dare you to expect more in your church. We invite you to start Peak and prepare today to expect the advance of the kingdom. I wanted to share the the promotional video for Peak with you. Um, I've mentioned, uh, I've started talking about this, but we are going to, as a congregation, use this tool that the district is making available to us uh, to help us to take steps forward. And I love the fact that she, uh, in that video, she says that we should expect God to work. It should be normal for us to expect to see the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so a part of what this is, as she mentioned, is a survey. I will be sending out a link via email this afternoon to our congregation. I'm strongly urging you to take advantage of the opportunity. In a group this size, literally, like you think about it, if there are thousands of people taking a survey, you could convince yourself that, yeah, my opinion doesn't really matter. In a group this size, you have a significant opportunity to speak into this process. And so I, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, I mentioned I'll be sending a link out this afternoon. This is a fairly lengthy survey. It'll take you about 30 minutes to complete. So make sure you set off a set out a, a carve out a block of time because it also will not, it, it just runs right through. And if you get halfway done with it and you have to stop and go do something, you come back later, you have to start over. So that's the bad news. The good news is you could start over. Uh, but again, I challenge you to uh, seriously um, 
prayerfully fill out this survey. This will help the peak leadership team as we, we've already met once with David Dixon from the district office, um, and I'm really excited about, about where we're headed and what we're going to be able to accomplish, and you, using this is a big part of that. So uh, again, I just want to challenge you to that. that. The email will come out this afternoon. If you're thinking to yourself, well, that's great, but I don't have email or I don't have internet access because I know we have some people who don't have that. If you need to, you can talk to me about it. I will get you a paper copy of it and you can fill it out by, by hand. Um, we have a, a PDF of it that I printed out. We can get you, you can fill it out, give it back to us. It is, it is anonymous, so if you give it to me, I will give it to somebody else who doesn't know where it came from. I won't look at it. I'll just pass it on, and someone else will enter the information. Um, so that's how they'll take the survey, in essence, for you, um, get, using your answers. So um, we've got a couple weeks to do this survey, but I would urge you not to put it off. That's typically what happens with surveys or, or with anything that has a time frame. You're like, okay, I, I got to get to that next week. I got to get to that. And then all of a sudden, everybody's scrambling because it's the last day of the survey. Take advantage of the opportunity to do it um, in a timely manner uh, because the quicker we get all of our results in, the faster we can get moving on um, digesting that information and figuring out where it's going to lead us. So I, I will continue to talk about this and we'll bring updates even after the survey closes. We'll be talking about it from time to time um, over the next several months as we work, walk through this process. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to ask, we're going to have our time for some, the kids to come up, so if you're um, here and you, and not driving yet, we'll say it that way, uh, come on up, let's have a little bit of time to talk through some things this morning. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna get up and walk away for just a second because I have to go back to the back right, right back there and then I'm gonna ask you a question from back there, okay? So you just keep watching me. Can you see right here? Do you know what that little square is? What if I do this? Now can you see it? Do you know what that little square is? What is that? A light, a night light? Do you have a night, does any, do any of you have a night light? Do you? I used to have a nightlight. Can I let you in on a little secret? Even as a grown-up, sometimes I'm afraid of the dark. Do you ever get afraid of the dark? You have a nightlight. What kind of nightlight do you have? I've seen your nightlight. Do you have a turtle nightlight? And it shines stars up on, the root, on your ceiling, doesn't it? Even as a grown-up, I get scared in the dark sometimes. And so I have, when I'm out in the woods... I put this on. I wear this on my head because I'm usually carrying stuff in my hands. But I can turn that on and then I can see where I'm going. And just in case the batteries die, I was never a Boy Scout, but I, but I like to think of myself as a Boy Scout, I have a second flashlight that I carry with me. So if my batteries die, I can still see to do stuff. And this flashlight, this belongs to Miss Kristen because she goes out walking in the mornings and in the winter time, it's dark for a long time. And so she carries a flashlight when she walks so she can see. You can pass it around. We use flashlights so that we can see what we're doing because sometimes we get scared, don't we? I know I do. I get scared in the dark sometimes. Do you know that most of the times when I'm scared, it's because I'm by myself. When I'm with people, I don't get scared. You ever like that? You're not, like it's, you don't need a nightlight in your room when there's people in your room with you, but when you're all by yourself, sometimes it's scary, isn't it? There was a guy in the Bible, his name's Joshua, and he was afraid, and Moses kept telling him over and over again, he says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, be courageous. But he said this, and I want to read a Bible verse to you. The Bible verse says this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. 
because of them, and he was talking about the, about the other people in the area. He says, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Did you know that even when you think you're all by yourself, you're not, because God's with you. Now, we still like to have a flashlight so we can see. It's okay to have a nightlight in your room. I love those nightlights in here, because sometimes if I'm walking in, in the sanctuary when it's dark out, I can't see and I walk into things. So those are very helpful. They're helpful, but we don't need to be afraid, because God is always with us. Now, I know this is a pretty long verse, but I printed it out because I want you to, t- I want you, you can, here, I'm gonna trade you. Can I have the flashlight? You take that, and here's one for you, and here's one for you, and that's to remind you that God is always with you, and you don't have to ever be afraid, okay? Thanks. You can go back to your seats. Thanks. And I printed, um, I printed a lot of these, intentionally knowing, like, I, I printed more than a dozen, and I knew I wouldn't need all of these for the kids, but I want to encourage you, I'm sorry, I'm probably stepping out of the camera, I want to encourage you to pick one up, and if we run out of them, I'll print you another one, I'll print you one if you don't don't get one and you want one. Um, I I was having breakfast with Dawn this week, and we were talking about taking to heart the the word of God and the messages, and he, he told me about a guy, he preached, Don preached a sermon on the importance of the word of God. You know, um, the psalmist says, I've hidden God's word in my heart. And he said, this man felt so strongly convicted by that, uh, by that sermon that he decided he was going to memorize the book of Ephesians. And Don said it took him quite a while. Uh, it was a retired gentleman, and, but eventually he did it, and he can recite the entire book of Ephesians. A- and I think so often, I, I actually did a, a midweek video a while back on um, memorizing scripture and talked about the fact that it's easy for kids to do. And sometimes I think we use that as an excuse not to do it as adults. But we need to remember that God's word is critically important to us and we need to commit it to memory so i'm gonna i am gonna walk out of the camera now i want you to uh, seriously consider memorizing whether it's that verse or not another verse commit god's word to memory start to um, internalize it take it in i think a lot of times um and and i've been i don't want to say guilty because that sounds like reading the Bible is a bad thing, but I'm going to say guilty. I've been guilty of reading large blocks of Scripture. Um, I've committed to, and I've talked about this, I've committed to reading through the Bible in a year, and I've done it every year since um, before I became a pastor, actually. Uh, I've done it, I'm going to say, 15 plus times. And that's great, but I think it's important, too, to narrow down and spend some time in a verse or in a couple verses let it let it get into your soul let it work in your soul this is a great bible verse to memorize can you imagine what an encouragement it would be to your life if you just actually lived out that truth that we can be strong and courageous and we don't have to be afraid because the lord your god is with you he will never leave you or forsake you and we're going to talk about that this morning Um, we're going to be looking at uh, continuing on in the series Unlikely Heroes, and um, we started this last week. We were looking at the cycle of humanity and the fact that the Israelites were in this vicious cycle where it was, you know, they fell away from God. He allowed the the enemy to overrun them. They cried out to him. He, He sends a deliverer, he saves them, and that happens over and over again throughout the book of Judges. But in Hebrews chapter 11, we read about a bunch of these guys that are all in one verse, and I think they're all there because, well, actually the author of Hebrews says why they're all there, so in Hebrews 11 verse 32 through 34, it says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. 
who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And, and I want to, so we're taking some time and looking at those different characters, um, but specifically from verse 34, where it says their weakness was turned to strength. And I think so often we think, ah, oh, you know, I, I don't have that much to offer, I can't do that much. That's not a bad thing. And so we're going to tackle the first person, and, and I'm not going through this list in the order the author of Hebrews wrote it. I'm going through this list in the order that they appear in the book of Judges. So the author of Hebrews says Gideon and then Barak. Um, when you're reading through Judges, Gideon comes after Barak. So we're going to start with Barak today. Uh, we're going to be in Judges chapter 4 um, and looking at the story of Barak and Deborah. Uh, will you ju just allow me to pray for us in our time together? Father, we recognize that you are amazing, that you are all-powerful, and that there's nothing that is too difficult for you. And so it's kind of puzzling at times when we don't live like that when we allow our weakness to get the best of us, when we allow our shortcomings to be front and center, rather than focusing on you, rather than being bold and courageous, rather than claiming the truth that you will always be with us. I pray that you would challenge us this morning to live for you, even if we're standing alone. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to read the first 10 verses of Judges chapter 4, just kind of as we set the stage. Um, it's recorded this way. It says, again, here we go with the Israelites, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harashath Hegium. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophetess, uh, the wife of Labadoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak son of Adoyam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give them into your hands. Barak said to me, said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah went along with them. So here we are, we see in the first couple verses, we see that cycle repeated. And if you were here last week, um, I said it, it's a cycle of rebellion, and then raiders come in, then there's remorse, then there's rescue, and then there's rest. And then it repeats. And as we looked at remorse, we talked about the fact that over and over and over again in, in, throughout these verses, uh, throughout the book of Judges, and actually throughout the whole Bible, it talks about crying out to the Lord. And we see that here in verse 3. It says, they cried out to the Lord for help. And um, if I could just stick a slight parenthetical in right here. This is the apologies and corrections section. Last week, I said that I intentionally used the word remorse rather than repentance because I don't know that they were repentant because they kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. And afterwards, um, actually over the next couple days, I really felt convicted about that because I don't get to decide what's in somebody's heart. And to make matters worse, they're talking about generationally. And so it may not even be the same people. I mean, 
here we read in verse 1 that after Ehud died, all this took place. So there's been this long gap of time. And I think it's easy for us, for me, to read Scripture and consolidate it in a time frame. I can read the entire book of Judges in a sitting. And so stuff that happened over hundreds of years, I read it like it's just bam, 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 bam. And so I want to be careful. Um, I'm, I'm one who has made the same mistake, read that sin, mistake's a good euphemism, more than once. And that doesn't mean that I didn't repent. That doesn't mean that there's something that gets called into question. That means that I'm struggling. And so for me to say that, you know, I don't know if they really repented, isn't fair to them. So I just wanted to apologize for that. And we will look at them as being truly repentant. We will assume that. But here we see in um, Judges chapter 4 that Ehud is dead. Now, I I just want to back you up. In chapter 3, we actually see three judges that are so brief that there isn't really even a story that goes with them. Othaniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Shamgar only gets one verse in the entire Bible. One verse. It says, Israel went through this cycle again. God raised up Shamgar and rescued them. That's about it. It doesn't matter what you're called to. It doesn't matter if it's this grand thing or if it's just something small. Andrew heard about Jesus from John the Baptist. Andrew, the first thing he did was go and tell his brother Peter. Now, Peter's this great figure in the Bible. There's, well, he wrote books of the Bible. We see all kinds of stories about Peter. We don't see that much about Andrew, but he was faithful to what he was called to do. And there would have been no Peter had there not been Andrew. So don't sell yourself short. Shamgar gets one verse. There were probably a lot of people who got no verses. That doesn't mean they weren't following God. It doesn't mean they weren't committed to God. It just simply isn't a part of the story. And so the author of Hebrews says, I can't even tell you about these guys because I don't have time to. And so you get this, you almost feel like they're insignificant. They're not. Neither are you. But we see the cry for help. And I love this because God is so faithful. The psalmist writes in Psalm 40, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Cry out to God. Allow him to do his work in your life and recognize that as you do that, others will see that. You don't have to have a a world spotlight. You just have to shine where you are. And so we see the Israelites fall into this cycle again, and we're introduced in verse 4 to Deborah. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I think I have a hard time putting myself into the culture to get how significant this passage of Scripture is. Israel's being oppressed to the point where there isn't a single man stepping up in a culture where women had no place. So the fact that Deborah is involved in this story at all is amazing. The fact that she is prominent and really kind of like the hero in the story is is absolutely phenomenal. But she's so she's a woman, she's a prophetess. And she's quite literally the judge. People in Israel, when they'd get into a dispute, would go see Deborah. And Deborah would sort through things for them. So she's a well-respected leader in the community. And as a prophetess, she gets a word from God. And so she tells, she sends for Barak. She, he comes in and she tells him. And again, in verses 6 and 7, it says, She sent for Barak, son of Ab- uh, Abinim, of Kadesh, Naph- of Naphtali, and said to him, and this, this, this is now she's quoting what God told her to say, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, here it is, go and take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them to Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, 
with his chariots and his troops to the Kadesh River and give them and give him into your hands. Notice, God calls Barak to be his tool. God's going to do the work. He says, Barak, I need you. Actually, he doesn't even say I need you. He says, I want you to show up. I want to use you. You are the tool in my hand. You're the instrument that I'm going to use to save Israel, to accomplish my purposes. He says, I will lead. I will give. And what's interesting about this is they're not even going to be in the same place. He says, you go to the mountain. I'm going to send him to the valley. And anybody that knows anything about, uh, about battles and warfare and stuff, mountains are great places to be. Valleys are not. You have to climb the hill. That's why you, you hear so much in war stories about taking that hill. If you can gain the higher ground, you are set. So here God says, take your guys, go up on the mountain. I'm going to send the enemy down in the valley. We'll take care of it. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But So that's the command that comes directly from God through Deborah. Barak's response, verse 8, he says, I'll go with you. Or he says, I'll go if you go with me. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going. And I think it's, it's important to recognize he's human. He's struggling. He's afraid. But what's interesting about this is we see people uh, throughout Scripture question God's calling. We see Gideon. Gideon did it. We're going to talk about him next week. Jonah Jonah didn't just question it. He, he flat out disobeyed it. He says, you tell me to go that way, I'm headed that way. Uh, Zechariah, you know, the angel of the Lord shows up and tells Zechariah, you're going to have a son. Zechariah questions it, and eventually he sees that it's true. Peter, I just, I just mentioned Peter. Peter has this vision, and um, God says, take something off of this, and there's all kinds of creepy animals on there. He says, take something and kill it and eat it. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a good Jew and I've never done anything like that. I'm not doing that. God has to tell him three times before Peter gets the message. So we see people question God, but what's interesting about all the examples I gave, and so often in scripture, we see people questioning God, not questioning God's message. Barak doesn't talk to God about it. Barak doesn't say, you know, I'm not sure about this. Are, are you sure you want me to do it? He doesn't open a discussion with God. He doesn't go to God with his fear. He just tells Deborah, hey, if you want me to go, you're going to have to go. He makes it about another person. For whatever the reason, he thought he needed Deborah with him. Now, maybe it was because Deborah was a sign of God's presence. Maybe it was because she was a guarantee that this really did happen. If she's making this up, she's not going to put herself in harm's way. Maybe she's bringing legitimacy because all of Israel acknowledges her. And he's thinking, how am I going to round up 10,000 guys? We're all afraid. For whatever reason, he says that I'm only going if you go. And her response is interesting. She says, uh, in verse 9, she says, certainly I'll go. Not a moment of pause, at least not that we see. She says, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with, with Barak to Kadesh. Now, I want you to show of hands, how many people have heard this story before? Okay, how many people know what's what's coming? How many people remember the story well enough to know what's coming? Okay, I, I think that's one of the things that we struggle with is we know the story. Many people know the story. And so I want you to think about it for the first time. You hear those words. Is your assumption that Deborah's gonna get the glory? That Deborah's gonna get the credit? That, I mean, that makes sense. He, she says, okay, you don't wanna do it by yourself? I'll go with you, but a woman's gonna get the credit. And I can't help but think that, that as Barak hears that, that's what he's thinking too. And he's like, well, you know, she's going to get the credit anyway probably. Everybody respects her. So it's no big deal to her. Or it's no big deal to him. But it's not what God intended. God was calling Barak to do something. And for whatever reason, 
He didn't want to, and he's making excuses. So in, starting in verse 11, we see this play out. It says, uh, now Heber, king of Kenite, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. When they were told, when they, when they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinam, had gone up to, the Mount, to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harishish Hagiom to the Kishon River all his men and the 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera, say that again, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got, got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Now, I, I want to speculate here just, just a little bit. Why do you suppose Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot? I was reading in uh, the Barnes Notes commentary, and I think this does, it, it shines some light on what's going on, but it does call for a little bit of speculation. But it says the, the Kishon Valley has this, it, it is, I think their words were dead flat. Like, it's just dead flat. But there's also, it's right right up against the mountain. And so if you have springtime, you have thaw, you have the the snow thawing, you have rain, you have torrents of water, and this is a place that floods very quickly and very intensely. And um, if you look at, in chapter 5, after the battle's over, Deborah and Barak both sing a song of praise to God. And I just want to read a couple verses from this. Um, Verses four and five, it says, when you, Lord, went out out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Eden, the, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. And then down in verse, verses 21 and 22, it says, the, the river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping, going his, might, going his mighty steeds. I think there's this picture painted in, in literary terms of a, a literal flood the men who are following Sisera literally get washed away. And I think he gets out of his chariot and runs because his chariot is not going anywhere. His horse is stuck in the mud. The wheels of the chariot are stuck in the mud. And he flees. And he gets away. But everybody else is captured. Everybody else is put to the sword. The Israelites win a mighty victory. So we see the calling on Barak's life. We see the condition he puts on on the terms of the calling. We see the consequences where Deborah says, a woman's going to get the credit. But let's look at the conclusion of the story. If you hop back to chapter 4, starting in verse 17, it says Sisera, so he's escaped on foot. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael. The wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said, please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there? Say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went in quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. And let me just stop here for a second. People who say, oh, the Bible's an old, crusty, boring book. I, I gotta tell you, there's some, there, there's, there's all kinds of intrigue. There's 
espionage. There's, there's all kinds of good story in the Bible. Um, I, I mentioned Ehud just briefly at the beginning. Ehud's one of my favorite characters because his entire victory is won through the Lord, but simply because he's left-handed. And as a person who's left-handed, I love that guy growing up. You know, so here's, here's this, and again, as, as a, if you're a middle school boy, this story is just awesome. She sneaks in and she, she literally drives a tent peg through the guy's head. I, I, you can, kids, this story will keep them occupied. So uh, verse 22, it says, Then Barak came, then Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went with her, and I can't help but thinking, oh, great, I'm going to get, I'm going to finally catch him. It says, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. God gets the victory. God gets the glory. But the credit went to someone other than, uh, other than Barak because he was afraid to stand alone. In Exodus chapter 33, we see a very similar situation. Moses. God says to Moses, you're going to have to do some work for me. And he's telling him to lead the children of Israel. And Moses says, it's starting in verse 12, it says, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me to lead these people, but you haven't told me whom will, you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name. I have found you with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this is your nation, these are your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me if you, and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish us and your people from the other people of the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. God says, I want you to do this thing. Moses says, I'm not going to do this thing unless Deborah goes. No, unless you go. Will you go with me, God? Are you actually leading me into this? Do you want me to do this? I need you. God says, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. The Bible verse that's laying over there, Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be terrified because of them and, and put whatever you want in there of them. The Israelites were facing people of, of the promised land. It doesn't matter what the fight is. It doesn't matter what the enemy is. It doesn't matter what the them is. Fill in your own them. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you never forsake you. I asked Lynn this morning to read a passage from James where James talks about faith and deeds. We need to not just say things. We need to allow our lives to show that we believe what we say. You have faith? Show me by your deeds. Deeds will not save us. We are saved by grace. God makes that abundantly clear. There's nothing that I can do that is good enough to earn salvation. I can't do it. But once I've been given salvation through faith, it should have an impact on my life. I should look different. And so James says, show me your faith through your actions. What are you afraid of? Is your fear causing you? to literally lose your courage, to be weak, to be afraid, to stand, to stand alone? Is your weakness a stumbling block or is it an opportunity for God? Paul says in my, in my weakness, God's strength is seen. Are you using it as an excuse 
to not serve God or an opportunity to have God get glory. Deborah could have claimed her womanhood as an obstacle. In that culture, there's no reason for her to be able to rise to the level she was in. But she stood with God. Bear could have claimed weakness as a worthy reason not to serve. And he tried that, but Deborah coaxed him into it. Allow yourself to be coaxed into a greater faith. Trust in God. Name it. What is it today that causes you fear? Give it to God. What's God calling you to do that you're afraid to try? Give it to Him. Don't allow anything to stand in the way of stepping into faithful obedience. Be strong and courageous. Heavenly Father, it is so easy to have the fears of this life capture our attention. It is so easy to lose sight of your bigness when we put our eyes on the things around us that are obstacles. I pray that you would redirect our focus, that we would see you more clearly, and that the things that are obstacles would not catch our attention, but that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that we would live a life that brings you glory and honor. We would stand with you, regardless of if anybody else is or not. We would live boldly for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask Don and John to come up and join us. Join me up here. We're going to... Um